So hi everyone, thank you so much for taking time to attend today's Fazana talk session. My name is Tanya and I'm the Chief Social Media Officer for Fazana, which is the Federation of Zoroastrian Associations of North America. So Fazana represents 27 Zoroastrian associations all across Canada and the United States, which is roughly 25,000 Zoroastrians in total. So Fazana Talks is a new digital initiative we launched this year to engage the Zoroastrian community with our youth in particular in order for us to discuss topics pertaining to our religion, our diverse culture, and our community. And if you want to stay up to date on future events, I just ask that you please follow us on Instagram and Facebook. It's at the Fazana, and I will make sure I link everybody in the chat. So these talks that we facilitate are a platform for people to simply share their thoughts, learn from each other, and also safe place to have a dialogue. We will have a Q&A today, so I just ask you to post any questions you may have for our speakers in the chat section. Today's session is being moderated by Vera Dinshaw Springett and Arvis Shroff Patel, who are the co-founders of Parsi's Exchange Recipes, also known as, popularly known as PER, which is a popular Facebook group where people share the recipes of delicious food recipes, both for Parsi food and more. And I say, if you aren't a member as yet, I highly recommend that you join this group. It's probably one of my favorite groups to be a part of, and it's just so absolutely positive. I really recommend it. Um, so this is the first time Fazana is collaborating with another organization, and we're so excited for today's insightful discussion. I'd love to do a brief intro to our speakers, uh, our moderators, and then we'll go right into it. So Vera Dinshaw Springett is a creative director for user experience at the University of Phoenix with almost 20 years of combined ad agency and in-house branding and digital experience. Originally from Pakistan, Vera came to the US to earn her bachelor's in advertising and master's in integrated marketing communications. She lives in Chicago with her husband and daughter and is a co-admin of PER. Arbis Shroff Patel is born and raised in Karachi, Pakistan. She came to the United States to earn a degree in medical technology. She worked at Smith, Smith Klein Beecham Medical Reference Laboratory, specializing in microbiology and virology, ultimately in a supervisory and then managerial capacity. Living in Plano, Texas, she's the mother of two children who have flown the coop, and she's also the co-admin of PER. With that, I'd love to now invite today's moderators to introduce today's speakers and lead the session. Thank you. Hi, thank you for the introduction, Stanya. Um, Arbiz and I are really thrilled to uh, be able to moderate this exciting conversation. We have um, three awesome panelists today. We have Nilfar Mavava, we have Naomi Mobid, and we have Jangir Mehta, and I'd love for them to um, introduce themselves to the group. Uh, do you want to start, Nilofar? Sure. Hi, thank you all for inviting me to join in this discussion today. I'm Nilofar Malwala. I was born and brought up in Karachi. I've lived in Dubai, a bit in London, and now I'm residing in Toronto. Um, I have a food blog with over 750,000 followers, and I have a Facebook page, two published books, and 10 e-cookbooks. Uh, I was invited to do Zoom demos uh, just as a request uh, by Dolly Dastur in end of March when COVID started. And this has uh, sort of snowballed into something bigger and larger, which is quite unimaginable. I do four uh, Zoom demos a week. Uh, I also have been doing about 150 Zoom demos so far and have over 500 people who attend. Not all at the same time, thank God, but a uh, few at a time every few days. I've been enjoying it. It's very interactive, very relaxed, very chilled, and I hope that we continue to do that for a while. Uh, PER has been a great platform uh, that I have been uh, involved with uh, Vera and Arvis are fantastic. Uh, they run a positive show and that's what I enjoy. Uh, people have a sense of discipline on it. Uh, they don't uh, only share, but they also uh, respect other people's work. And we have about 13,000 or 14,000 people on it, but it's very, very interactive and come join us. It's really, really great. Um, also, it's unbelievable 
how many people are so very talented and how many people put up the most beautiful pictures, uh, recipes. Uh, we are constantly learning and that is what I enjoy PER uh, the most for. I hope that this continues and uh, I know that people have more time during COVID to do this, but even after, I hope it continues because uh, it's a great platform. And I really wanted to thank Arvez and Vera for always taking care of each one of us. Um, thank you, Nilfer. That's very sweet. That was very sweet and it's our pleasure. Yeah, thank you. We, we really enjoy PR as well. We never expected it to blow up quite the way it did. <laughs> but I think um, we've both worked really hard on this platform and we're very proud of it. So thank you, we appreciate it. Um, yeah. Nilifer, I mean, sorry, Naomi, would you like to go next? Sure, absolutely. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Naomi Mobed, and I was born in Karachi and lived in a number of places around the world, um, including Iran, other parts of the Middle East, like UAE, Oman, and so on. And eventually, after having a number of different careers and um, really spent a lot of time in banking in Britain, moved back to the United States and started this very small specialty food uh, company called Le Bon Mago. And we really, the aim of the company was to bring the combined flavors of Africa, Middle East and South Asia into the marketplace. Because when I moved back, I realized that much of what was available in terms of the flavors that we enjoy as a global community um, were pretty dumbed down flavors or they were simply categorized as ethnic and parceled into a corner of a grocery store or, you know, absolutely sold in a separate, you know, separate store altogether with using very poor ingredients and really didn't represent um, what my experience had been as a Parsi and as a Zoroastrian all over the world, combining different ingredients. And, um, you know, so I felt that we needed to pay a little bit of homage to that and also ensure that people really know how people live and cook in the real world and not everything in a jar needs to be um, you know, dust-ridden cloudy spices with frozen or canned vegetables. So that being said, um, we, you know, first launched with um, a series of chutneys, preserves, um, achars, etc. And the aim was also to really break into the mainstream audience. The products were not necessarily purely targeted to Parsis or people of South Asian origin or African origin. They were really much broader than that and felt that, um, and I felt that, you know, we use them at home in so many different ways. So why can't we sell it like that? You know, there's no reason why an achar cannot be um, included on a charcuterie board or on a cheese board. It doesn't have to be eaten with a dal, dal per se or with rice or whatever. So that was really the aim, um, was to develop that crossover. And, you know, another objective was to expand this into an array of other products, but, um, or other product categories, I should say. But um, at this stage, we're facing a lot of challenges, COVID notwithstanding. And, um, you know, we can get into that a little bit later, but uh, that's what I do. I'm the owner of a small, little food business. Awesome. Thank you, Naomi. That was a great introduction. I think my favorite line was dust-ridden cloudy spices in jars. I agree. Sometimes uh, they can be a little um, off-putting, but your jars are just beautiful and the branding is gorgeous. So, well, thank you. We really appreciate you joining us for this call. Um, let's move on to Jangir Mehta. Um, Jangir, are you there? Yeah, so thank you so much for having me. And I really 
have to say that Vera and Arbez are inclusive because they did pick the only male, the only one born in Bombay and not Karachi. So I have to say you all are very inclusive. So thank you so much for letting me represent these two categories of minority within a minority. So having said that, um, what, uh, I basically have uh, two restaurants in New York City, uh, Graffiti Earths and Me and You. Both have two little bit of different uh, philosophies, but one of the main ones being is sustainability. And we breed sustainability in every format from what we purchase to what we do. But the most important thing that we promote out there is the aspect of vulnerability through sustainability because only to show up truthfully with imperfections can one showcase vulnerability. And that is what we really, really focus on and zone in on, on the aspects of being truthful to the imperfections uh, which are being offered uh, in terms of produce as well as uh, regular, right from plates to all of that, which we'll definitely get into during the talk. But all of those aspects of showcasing that truthfulness to the cause of, uh, of sustainability. And that is really spoken through the aspect of being vulnerable. And so that is something that we truly, truly pin down on, on the talks we give, on the work that I do with universities like Rutgers, Ryder, as well as Stevens Institute. And so that's where we stand there. And the other uh, uh, place that I own is a private salon, which is called Me and You, which where pretty much we take the essence of who you are and make a story out of that. So we send you a questionnaire based on what you talk and tell us about you we formulate a story and every course that we serve you is a story of your life. So we are reliving memories. Ooh. So that is, it, it, I, think it, the, I think one of the most difficult people to do that would be someone like Naomi, who's gone everywhere, been everywhere, done fantastic stuff and put it into one little jar. So it would be a, one of the hardest me and you concepts that I'll have to do if she one day prompts me to do that. But uh, so in terms of all of those stories is how we can formulate. And that is what me and you is. And I'm very, very thrilled. And thank you again for having Juan Zorastrin from Bombay. That's such a great I mean, That's like super cool. That that's really amazing. is. Oh, and by the way, we also have an Irani Sartusti who lives in New Zealand, but unfortunately because of the time difference and all, hopefully we will get her on a future talk. Great. Absolutely. And we have quite a few other men from Bombay under our sleeves for future conversations. Oh, please, so, you don't mm -hmm. have to correct me on that. I just was mentioning <laughs> <No. laughs> no, we're, we're really proud to have you, but we, we uh, definitely love to embrace our um, male participants yeah. but um so a small note vera you guys better book out me and you quickly because the dates go i know i know don't worry it's three months in advance six months and, the, advance. and the last thing i think i do want to say is thank you to arzan for inviting at least myself and putting this together and the, uh, one other thing is uh, America yesterday lost one of its best, and that is Ruth Bader Ginsburg, our Supreme Court Justice. So, Vera, you could show off that mug. And uh, she was an inspiration to many, many people and to most humans. That's the most important thing. She was a great human. Absolutely. I think I was numb for most part, part of last night, but back to it today to keep the good fight going. But thank you so much for the, uh, introducing yourself, John Gear. We're so happy to have all of you on board. We've, we've invited all of you specifically because you're great champions of sustainability, um, which happens to play a really large role in our community, in our religion. And so um, we're here to you know, talk about our culture where, and how sustainability has been a part of our heritage as well. So, um, I know that Nilifer uh, likes to talk about what part sustainability has in our heritage. Nilifer, would you like to kick us off on that? 
So basically, uh, we all know that Parsi food is very uh, familial. Uh, it's unpretentious. It's simple. Uh, it's something that uh, we like to use the word barkat, has barkat in it, meaning it goes a long way somehow. And never about a number of people, but served at a table and everybody shares in and digs in. So that is uh, one very, the very essence of having Parsi food, uh, that it's also affordable and wholesome, relatively healthy, uh, possibly because we don't have cheese and chocolate in it. I don't know, I'm just kidding. Uh, the other thing is there's the sense Maybe because it was an it is an ancient cuisine, but maybe not. It's farm to table. It's the real farm to table aspect that we uh, are talking about these days so much everywhere. And we are talking about seasonal foods. We always ate seasonally. It was so important. Uh, also in those days, obviously, you weren't uh, easily accessible to other parts of the world or it took very long or it never arrived. So you ate locally and you ate seasonally. And that was a good thing. It was a good thing. Also no wastage. There was never any wastage. Uh, so every part of the animal or the fish or the meat or, or the uh, seafood had to be utilized. It was not about being rich or poor. It was just the way it was. Also remember we all most of us lived in large families. All of us had large families. Just two generations above me, uh, my grandfather was one of 11, my grandmother was one of 11, and most of us had families like that. So everybody lived together. Uh, they had to s feed a lot of mouths three times a day. So that was in one part, the reason behind it. The other part, it was just very Zoroastrian not to waste. Uh, remember when I'm talking next, it's not about uh, being frugal or being stingy. There's a huge difference between the two and we are definitely not going on the stingy path. Okay. So minimal waste, no waste is what we are talking about. So for instance, if you had a fish, uh, ras chawal, machina ras chawal always had the fish head. That's how it was made. And everybody enjoyed it, relished it. It was a delicacy. And because you ate that way, you knew that it was not just a fish head. Today, the fish head is thrown into the bin uh, for most of the time, but other cultures still kind of use parts of it. It's also uh, the healthiest part of the fish tastiest and healthiest. Uh, the gharab, the fish roe. Uh, I don't know of any other cultures except making caviar from it who use the fish roe in their food. We used to fry it if we found it in season or of course pickle it. Uh, prawns. The best part of a good prawn curry is the head of the prawn and the shells of the prawn. So if you really want to make an authentic one, you need to boil the, uh, just the shell, it's extra work, and then add that uh, sort of fish broth or fishy broth to the curry. And that's what makes your curry exceptional. Uh, that's a nowadays, really good tip. It's a really good tip. And really if good. you still have people who enjoy peeling it at the table, you can even put the whole shrimp in, or you can compromise right. and put half and half, you know. Uh, but I've seen the next generation, they don't want to eat even a bone on the, in the meat dishes, forget fish. They would freak out if you had to show them a fish head, you know. But it's our fault, nobody else's. So we can reintroduce it slowly. Don't have to give them a shock treatment, but slowly we can reintroduce it. I think one of the best things um, I've seen in Chicago specifically over the past like five to 10 years is 
um, this concept of farm to table and concept of using every part of the animal and not wasting it. So there are a lot of restaurants that focus specifically on doing just that. And so um, I think that's a really important concept that you bring up and it's good that it's, not, it's being revived in Western cultures as well. It is. And uh, for his last point, which is, you know, the fact that the younger generation, irrespective of culture or ethnicity, um, and it may not even just be younger generation, even my generation, I meet a lot of people who find bone, skin, uh, anything like that really unappealing on their plates. And I think to a large degree that comes from the fact that many of them still don't know where their food comes from. And I think Junger may end up touching a little bit on that. Um, you know, they haven't been to, the, they don't go to the markets anymore. So everything comes pre-prepared, pre-cut, cleaned under a cellophane wrapper. And mm. they buy one that has the prettiest color and the newest date and put it into their cart. If something has a blemish on it or if something just has uh, mm -hmm. you know, a little bit of skin or something, it, it, it's something they find very unappealing. And they've never had to really look at the origins of that food before it's brought to the table. Absolutely. And it's, uh, as parents, it's our fault. Uh, also, I think we lost track somewhere so like Naomi says, it's not the generation that's born and brought up in the West. Uh, my nieces and nephews are all born and brought up in Karachi uh, in the same homes that we were brought up in, but they have a different mindset because we started copying the West. And a fillet of fish has to be there. You can't put a slice of fish, you know? So these things are wrong. Also, the flavor of the fish is in the bone, so we are losing out a lot. Uh, but having said that, uh, we as a community have loved pickling. Pickling was also started uh, as the way not only to save what was in abundance in your house, uh, but also a way to eat through the winter months. Now, this pickling or winter months is only Iran related. India doesn't, Bombay and Pune and all don't really have a cold winter to worry about. But it is a way that we saved a lot of our foods and vegetables. So in the fruits, obviously it's India because mango is the main pickle that we have as a community. And it's really amazing if you give a thought to it that it's from conception. So you have these little baby uh, unripe mangoes that you make into pani no achar, and then you go on to every stage of the mango. And we have like maybe 10 types of mango achars, which we all love and relish. And then of course we have the eggplant achar, and then we have other pickles like lemon and uh, muramba and ambakalyo and all of this. And it is uh, sort of a delightful way of not wasting what is in your fridge or freezer. I think PR thing, has, sorry, I was just gonna say through PR, we've learned, I've learned specifically so much about all the different kinds of mango pickles we have. I thought we had like five that my grandmother made, but oh my God, we have uh, like, yeah different names for different ones. Like India will call the same thing, something different. And it's it's just amazing how much we've learned from people on PER about different mm -hmm. mango Japanese. So even in that, there was seasonal. For instance, avakalyo was something that they served with Tamsa at a gum bar. So avakalyo from the mango is only made in the summer months because it's not something that stays very long. So in the winter months, if they needed to do a gumbar, they used to use peaches. So there is a peach avakalyo and a mango avakalyo. So that sort of thing is again, going back to seasonal. And there's always something that they were innovative about. And 
you know, I, I just marvel at the way uh, these ladies, mostly ladies, there were men involved in it, but mostly ladies sitting at home used to come up with these beautiful, beautiful uh, produce from really very little. For instance, the yeah. white bottle goes or the dodi. So not only do you make dodi chal and dodi gos and murabba from it, you also have a recipe that uses the skin of the dodi. So that's amazing because it's edible, because it's soft enough, there is a use for it. So we all need to realize that it's not garbage. Don't throw it away. Think about it. Now, I've never actually eaten the watermelon one, but I've heard that they make something out of the watermelon skin as well. And we would love to learn more about it. We would love to try it. I would love to try it out. And if somebody has something from their grandparents and they want to share, come on PER and share it with us. We'll all try it. And that's how the community builds. Don't think that we know everything. I don't know everything and I'm ready to learn. We have to share and that way we can save every little thing that we can and make something delicious out of that. So that's yeah. part of the pickling process. The last part is leftovers and substitutes. So for instance, I know recipes are recipes and uh, we have certain dals for dansak and certain dals for masur nugos and whatever, but sometimes you run out of it. Say COVID. Why take anything even further than just the COVID? Uh, we all had to sit at home. We all had accessibility to different stores. Uh, we ran out of things. We had to do without. We had to do whatever. So, so what? Every dal can be used with the same mm -hmm. process as something else. It's easy. <clears throat> Don't get fixated. Try your hands at everything. Uh, if you have a little less meat in it, so what? The flavor is there. You don't have to eat the meat itself. If you don't have it, you don't have it. You substitute it with something else. There's always an option. Don't get stuck on anything. We also always engage in patties and cutlets and things like that. Those are all from leftovers. So if I make keema today and I have a little bit left tomorrow, I turn it into keema na patties. So that way, if I add potato to it, it looks different, it tastes different, and everybody loves it. So this is how you kind of make sure your family is always happy with whatever you put at the table. They are always grateful for it. You have so many different things. And it's so much fun to use leftovers. I think it's great fun to use leftovers. And one dish can be into three. Like yesterday, I made papri. So you can eat papri on its own, which I think is very delicious. You can add prawns to it. You can add meat to it. You can eat with kebabs. You can eat it with meat kebab or jingana kebab. So there's so mm. much variation, right? And everybody has a favorite. So take it by turns so that everybody in the family enjoys it. Also, very, very important part as the person running the kitchen, mother or father. Do not avoid the foods that you dislike. It's very, very wrong. If I don't like dodi and I never feed my kids dodi, why am I depriving them of something that they might like? Mm. So it's very <clears throat> important as a mother not to just keep putting on the same dishes that you enjoy, but give them a chance to try different things, right? So yeah. there are certain parents who don't like too many vegetables or too many whatever. So you have to do that. And also yeah. uh, things like, uh, you know, sometimes a little bit of something is left over. Don't throw it away. Add it into something else. So for instance, I was making rush chawal once and I had a bowl of gajar mevano achar lying outside and it was just a little bit, but I don't like to put it back into the bottle. 
So I wasn't going to throw it out. So I dumped it into the rust towel because it had dried up because I'd left it by mistake outside open. And believe me, it was the best rust towel that I've ever eaten. So it's just one of those things. If you don't take a chance, you're not going to know. So I really, really would like you all to go out there, open your fridge, find something that you're thinking of throwing away and dump it into something else and just see how it tastes. You know, that last bottle, the last teaspoon in your jar, don't throw it away. Use it. Yeah. In mm -hmm. Thank you, Nilofer. That's a great segue into like our next area of this topic, which is so with COVID-19, um, it's really impacted the way we eat, our food chain supply. It's really impacted all parts of our lives. And so, um, you know, I'd like to invite Naomi and Jangir to discuss how, um, you know, they've taken COVID-19 into stride and maybe, you know, adapted to the way it affects their businesses in a negative and positive way. So if, if either one of you could talk about that or both of you could talk about that, that would be great. Naomi, yeah, you could start, no problem. Want me to start? Um, so for us as a small, very small company, the challenges of our supply chain certainly predate COVID for us because there were a few sort of non-negotiables that I had laid down for myself when I started the business. The first non-negotiable was that I wanted to use fresh local produce. Now, with the reality of manufacturing and production, when we talk about local businesses, it typically, local produce, it means essentially sourcing from around the United States. I would love to be able to source from simply 15 or 20 minutes away from me, but you know, after the summer months um, and based on the seasonality of the ingredients, it's very difficult for me to do that. So I have to go beyond New Jersey, Pennsylvania, uh, you know, the, essentially the tri-state area. Um, but we source our produce and we use fresh produce um, in all of our ingredients. So that was the one, that was one big non-negotiable. The other, um, the, and coming back to this produce issue, you know, it's very difficult to source, um, keeping fresh, making sure that you have relatively younger vegetables for certain items, or in the case of, let's say, our tomato chutney, we would really love to have almost blemished, slightly overripe tomatoes, which make more sense to us. And when we went out to actually source these vegetables um, or fruits and wanted variable degrees of um, ripeness or, um, I should say, uh, you know, unattractiveness, not imperfect, imperfect produce. We found it extremely difficult, actually. We went and talked to distributors of produce, small and large in our area. And while many of them had, generically speaking, what they called sustainability projects, um, they were more likely to either throw that produce away if they had an ability to give it to smaller restaurants, they would do that, but they had no way of somehow packaging that produce and for us to be able to take it into a production environment. So that was one of the first yeah. challenges that I faced. Um, one of the, the second thing. Well, the audio is not working. Mm -hmm. Should I continue? Yeah, yeah hi. If, if you've got your, um, if, if everybody could just mute their lines while we have our panelists speak, that would be awesome. Thank so you. that was one of the, so that was one of the first challenges that, you know, that I had. Maintaining that quality, but also making sure the supply chain was there. And of course, during COVID, 
um, especially when we were under lockdown, we actually made a decision not to produce because there was such... See, it comes from you. But not good. I'm sorry, can we mute our lines, please? Yeah. Thank you. So that we, um, you know, so we, we did stop production, uh, you know, for the simple reason was to ensure the safety of our staff. And also we had difficulties getting the supplies that we actually needed. Um, so, yeah, I mean, these were some of the, you know, these are some of the challenges that we had faced. And then on the distribution side during COVID, um, we, you, I mean, you could see business steadily slowing down. So even though we do sell to a number of grocery stores, we, you know, sell to well over uh, 500 to 600 locations across the United States and sell across all 50 states and specialty food stores. Um, we did find that for our category, um, sales were slowing down. People were buying food that was more child friendly and they didn't view um, our products to necessarily be child friendly. So we actually learned a lot of lessons about how to name our products, how to market our products, um, you know, post COVID coming out of it and specifically as we develop new ones. So while still retaining the integrity of the brand, but how do we make it a little bit more user friendly um, for a larger audience and certainly to include children as well. So that's really interesting. I never thought of the idea of making food child friendly as well, especially in such a time, but I think that's just a natural transition in times like this. Absolutely. Look, ice cream yeah. have exploded. The ice cream market has exploded during COVID. Right. Certainly other snack food items, um, large scale, large jars of pasta sauce, you know, like a marinara and things like that. Those have exploded. Pickles, interestingly enough, have exploded because people were looking for low fat snack foods because they were, you know, eating that bag of potato chips, but at the same time, we're trying to maintain somewhat of a health regime. So the pickle was a, a go-to. Um, you know, we, in terms of my products specifically, we're stocked next to the cheese counter. Mm -hmm. so we're sold as a specialty item in a grocery mm -hmm. store. So our, you know, sort of fate is more or less tied in with charcuterie and cheese. And if you see a reduction in that, um, then, you know, we're going to have, we're, it's going to be the same, similar for us as well. Right. It's a great point. Awesome. Jungir, do you have any thoughts on that? Sure. And before I, I wanted to jump in over here. I have a friend who goes to the grocery stores and just picks up, she has them pick up the, uh, save the ugly fruit and vegetables for her. And she's making juices and smoothies. And she's now going to turn it into a small little business because it's Great. just taken off being so su successful with her friends and everyone. It's a great Great. And the, you know, the grocery store doesn't have to pay to try and get rid of that produce. They pass it on to her and she uses it up. Brilliant. It's amazing. Sorry, so, Jagger, go on. No problem at all. So before I get into the COVID aspect, I just want to touch over a few points that Nilifa did mention and, uh, and the topic that was mentioned regarding um, our heritage and stuff like that. I mean, I, I am not dissing heritage, but I just feel that we need to accept what is and let go of what was. And sometimes you need to let go of what was is, when I say that, is change the aspect of story like even with our kids when you would say oh we did it that way they automatically take it that's an outdated aspect of thinking so versus just changing that conversation as this is what it is and accepting what it is is a better approach it is just like a PR story how you word that PR story will make it very efficient for you like if you did that same aspect of a fish head 
But if you put it on Instagram and made it beautiful with the right color of red that Naomi is wearing on her lips, it's going to change the conversation. So <laughs> it's the same thing. It's, it's the aspect of changing red to look like a beautiful lipstick or red to look like blood. It's about how you change that story. And uh, so it is, I think, the same thing versus we saying that we did the fish head in this manner of making it into a sauce, instead of using it in the sauce, then we as cooks manage shredding that whole thing and from that making and shredding it completely that fish head into the sauce, all right? And saying this is a shredded fish sauce is now going to make this population understand this is a shredded fish sauce and it's not a head sauce. So it's just how you can manipulate the food and bring it to the customer to what this generation feels that is very acceptable in looks, very acceptable in the way they like to eat. I think as, I think as chefs, we have to change that whole conversation. And if you do that, the same dish is going to be accepted more easily. And I think that is the most important thing. Uh, like 20 years ago, we used to take our watermelons and we, uh, skin and we, uh, we did a sweet pickle to put it into our dessert. So basically, it was more of a layer in one of our cakes that we made, but it was like in whole slabs, we used to put that as a sweet pickle to, to generate and, and have less waste. So it could be more so of, it sounds wasted, but you don't assume that as your story that I did it to create less waste. You created this because to build the right profile for this dish. So it is really telling them it in a different format sometimes does help sell that story. On the other hand, the same thing is, about books. I always say take a cookbook just like a prayer book or your religion. You do not follow everything from your religion. You love your religion, but you will only take the aspects that work for you and you would say, oh, I love my religion. Same way, take your cookbook as a guideline and then build it according to the flavors and profiles that you prefer to have. So always use your cookbook in that format or a recipe in that format. And Coming down to the last point of the COVID aspect, uh, just like Naomi said, we have built ourselves a COVID environment or whatever you may from the very start. We, we are jokingly called the ER of food, which is we won't let the food die till you are really dead. That's how much we will extract the shit out of food. And that is what we do in terms of the profile, in terms of how you can stretch the product in terms of stems, the roots, all those parts, how another product can be elevated to or made into. And uh, again, sometimes wording as you in PR are one of the uh, queens of doing that is we call our, we don't call our ugly produce ugly produce, we call it cosmetically challenged produce. And cosmetically challenged just somehow fits better into people's thinking and psychic. Oh, I'm so sad. I have this pimple on me or I'm so sad. My hair is curly. So just trying to bring that. But how do you create that beauty into every human and every part of that vegetable and trying to showcase that and telling the truth to that story is very important. But main thing is how do you make it look better for people because that is where the society unfortunately has gone to and if it is that society of instagram if it is that society of looking uh, and looks make that product sell to a great extent even showcasing that impurity and that uh, the aspect of a blemished tomato but worked into a recipe which is very very innovative can absolutely change the conversation so i think Having said that, that is something which is very, very uh, important. And in a, a time like this, uh, where we are facing that aspect of COVID, where we, uh, a lot of people have done that because of food insecurity, is why they have now 
try to stretch that product of not wasting that one teaspoon of something. Or it could also be the aspect of not having it. And the third could be that you just are bringing those roots of your generations, which did things like this, of seeing to it how two aspects could be blended or how we can instead of, uh, like very honest, sometimes you just read a recipe or even if you know what to make, if you do know you need crushed uh, um, almonds, or for instance, or, or, uh, or any dry fruits, on an average, most good stores will sell, there will be a product which will say broken cashews, broken almonds, buy that, that will be a dollar cheaper right there because you are going to take good cashews and break them why don't you just go and buy the broken ones from the beginning and that could save you a little bit so sometimes just looking into that is also very very crucial i feel that will also make you change the way society deems it and uh, when naomi goes about making it child friendly if she saw uh, i think i did send a picture to her if she had seen that picture and put it up of how my daughter eats her tomato uh, uh, chutney, it was, it was embarrassing. It was more than ketchup is how she ate it. I didn't share it to you. Oh, I, I should. Okay. So I definitely should. So it was, it was uh, very, very embarrassing of how she took that whole jar and we had to stop her literally from grabbing it and eating it as, uh, and dipping every single bit of it, uh, whatever that day she was eating. But uh, the point is sometimes just really challenging them into thinking differently is also important. But I always say, take a medium that works for you. So for instance, if your child likes dumplings, but absolutely detest kale, try to make a dumpling, which is 70% pork as she likes it or whatever she likes in that dumpling or he liked in that dumpling and put 30% of kale and introducing your palate slowly and steadily in a medium that they enjoy. The medium and the carrier was the dumpling. The dumpling is making that child happy or is making your customer happy. Create another aspect which will almost be an underlying statement to that product and your palate will get used to it. And nutritionist will let you know it takes about 20 times for your palate and your brain to actually sink in together to know that that flavor is not so akin to your palate as well as your brain so 20 times tasting that product will be the only way your palate and brain will say well it doesn't seem so bad or it doesn't seem so akin to me so use a medium use a medium of like naomi said ice cream is is selling greatly what and your child is not eating enough of dry fruits or nuts, take a vanilla ice cream, put nuts and a, a teaspoon of uh, raisins in it. Tell them, you'll get eight ounces of your ice cream, but we are going to put these toppings. And, and even, even if you don't have to tell them, don't make it a big deal, just do it. But because the medium of that ice cream of eight ounces is so much uh, uh, of a joy that that two ounces of nuts and dry fruit is not going to make a difference to that child at that point. So, I love that philosophy. Oh, so just yeah. change the change the way you approach food and talk about it in a different way, and things will make a big difference. Yeah, I love that. I'm saying ice cream. Sorry, uh, I wanted to say something. Go ahead, uh, Naomi. Oh, Nilo first. Yeah. Uh, so when Jangi said something about change the way uh, to make it look different or whatever, I wanted to say that a few months ago, uh, there was a challenge that came up and my elder daughter is also very much into food. She's in England and she decided to join it with, uh, join into the challenge with a friend and she wanted to do something Parsi and they had some rules to follow. So we discussed it and she turned a hamburger. So it was keema pa idu with tamota ne aduni jam. No ketchup, no burger, no nothing. And she actually won that challenge. And now it's turned into her favorite keema pa idu and she calls it the KPE 
Burger or KPE, some, she just calls it KPE. And she started doing it in pop-ups in London, in cafes every Thursday. And it's huge. It's massive. It's basically just Kima, Idu, and Pao. But she's put it into this thing. And it's doing really, really well. And everybody keeps asking what kind of a cuisine it is. So one small change is going to go a long way into transforming people in East London to learn how to eat chemo. So it's good fun. So you're absolutely right. Thank you, Thank you Noah, for- It's um, amazing. Yeah, I, and I love this philosophy of, you know, um, helping your children just develop their palate. I've been trying to do that with my daughter since she was really young and and just like you said um john gear you know trying if it doesn't work one month it may work the next month and that's just how you keep developing their palate to the point where we'll order or or eat anything and my daughter i don't have to ask my daughter if she wants to try it she'll come up and ask me i'll try it can i just try it and if she doesn't like it she doesn't like it and we move on we try it again the next month and that's okay um but uh, having said that, um, we're doing the same thing with right, yeah, Sorry. great. Uh, this has been a great conversation. We have a lot of really good questions. I think one of the one of the first questions we have here is from Sunu, who says, "You know, what is sustainability? What is sustainability? If you could explain that, um, uh, Jungir, I know that you know your restaurants really." Um, specialize in sustainability? Maybe that's a great question for you, if sure. you could answer that. So sustainability to us, to everyone, sustainability might mean different, all right? But sustainability to us is to make a difference in whichever way you can. It could be the smallest difference of not just, maybe you're not, for you it is buying blemish produce is not your thing, but not having waste might be yours. So it could be this con the same conversation for your family might work in a sustainable way in a different format. Like at our place, yes, we try to see it from where we buy, what we buy, all right? That is trying to uh, source only broken uh, scallops, for instance, that the fishermen get a better uh, income because broken scallops are generally thrown back into the ocean because people are used to having a certain way of looking at a scallop and they are not used to seeing a broken scallop. So how could you get them a better wage by buying such produce? So it could be something of that nature to vegetables or all of that. Then going into the fashion industry. Fashion industry is another industry which has a lot of waste of cloth. We try to see to it that how we can take the aspects of fabrics which are thrown away, which are not going to be used by the fashion industry, taking those small pieces of fabric and making our napkins with it. So again, our napkins are about eight inches by eight inches. We figured out another thing is um, taking seersucker material, you didn't have to iron. So now we have an eight inch napkin, which you don't have to iron. So now it became two things. We got a smaller napkin, smaller napkins. That means that many more can fit into a washing machine. All right, so less water that was used. No ironing needed because of seersucker. So now we have, cha we have changed the aspect of not having waste in electricity, as well as the, uh, the aspect of a smaller napkin being the case. So, uh, and not having waste in the fashion industry. Then the, the third part came into the uh, being of plateware and cutlery and crockery. Their styles change lifestyle changes. No one from my family wishes to see those old Parsi British floral plates. They don't wish to see it, but in a small place like mine, they think that it is very, very cool. So every time we, we went to Bombay, bags and bags of stuff of anyone who didn't want any of their uh, old crockery came over to the restaurant, and that is what we used here. So now it is thrash for another person, is beauty for another, or it is just what we needed to do. So it is the aspect of using silverware crockery, all of that became the aspect of not having waste. So being sustainable is trying to see to it how each one of us as a whole, as a community could benefit. And I think 
it's very, very important. Now, even if you are as a, as a person staying in your, uh, st- uh, I mean, you don't have to have a restaurant, but what I mean to say is even if you are a family, you, there's no shame in asking, do you wish to need this because I'm getting rid of it? I think that is also an aspect of sustainability mm-hmm. because you are spreading the aspect that to me, it's not needed, but maybe for you it is. And you're not doing it out of judgmental aspects of asking only as someone who is lesser than you, but asking in terms of when I say lesser than you is meaning in terms of monetary lesser than you. It, it should not, monetary should not be the aspect of trying to showcase waste. It should be an aspect of just not having to have a need for something and you're wishing to share that aspect. And a lot of people think that the aspect of shame comes into it when you are trying to be sustainable. And that is something that you need to break the barrier of shame, that it is not to be, there's nothing to be shameful. And hope is the passion of being possible. And I think that is very, very important. Hope is stronger than fear. So try to hope that this is not something that is dreadful to do, but something better to do for the world. I think that is most important. That's a really nice uh, perspective, Jangir. I think uh, what PER does really well in that area, especially during COVID, we had challenges that we put up where, you know, we were challenging people to reuse the food that they had and leftovers that they had to make a new and Um, exciting dish that they've perhaps never tried before. I mean, I personally, who don't have time to cook most days, um, felt myself challenged to do that. And it was fun and it made PR, you know, exciting and, and the possibilities just grew and everybody was like, oh, I never thought of doing that. But, you know, this was the time to do it. And there was no shame in it. And I think when it comes to Parsis anyway, there's no shame in reusing food. We just don't do that uh, most of the time, I hope. Um, but yeah, I think that's a really great perspective. Thank you for thank you for sharing that. My pleasure. Um, we have to, to your point, Vera. You know, we grew up um, being told that it's a, it's a sin Absolutely. to waste food. It's actually a sin. That's how we grew up. That's what we were taught. And okay. when we had leftovers after we finished our meal, it went, you know, to the servants or to whomever. It it did nothing. Went in the trash. It's the same thing at weddings and now jokes, all the food that was left over was then given to all the staff and, yep. you know, people still ate, nothing went into the trash and that carried on over here when we came here. Okay, we didn't have servants and all to, to pass the food on to. So we just recreated with that. Yeah, we had that. We used it up in, in different ways. So that has just continued. And I always, I tell my kids, you know what, we left Iran for India to sustain our religion. Mm-hmm. So sustaining is in us. Right. It's in our blood. It's in and our And that's being. what we do. We yeah. just consider everything wasted is a sin. Yeah. So we don't waste. And I think our religion teaches us that. You just don't waste. It's your it's respect for all of God's creations Absolutely. that come into this. So we take a lot of these conceptual ideas and then execute that in a very practical way in a production environment. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, those are some of the guiding principles that we have, but what we started to do from day zero is identify sources of ingredients wherever possible, where we could buy directly from the farmer or the grower, perhaps Mm -hmm. through one intermediary or through an owner of that company. But let's say, for example, our saffron. Our saffron is a single origin saffron. We buy from a company that directly works with a small community of farmers in Afghanistan. We've done the same thing with our vanilla, for instance. So, you know, the our commitment at Le Bon Mago was that from day zero, as long as it didn't impact the flavor, even mm-hmm. if you're spending a little bit more for that particular ingredient, we were always going to target single origin um, companies and support that. So, um, you know, our turmeric, for instance, is one that we're really looking to convert. 
from using a standard commoditized uh, turmeric to one that it comes from a very small farm actually um, in Rajasthan. And we're working to see whether we can, you know, price that optimally and bring it in, um, you know, for use currently in our caponata, what we, it's basically, um, you know, the aubergine achar that we make um, and other ingredients. So sustainability for us, you know, covers a whole gamut of activities. It includes things like the type of peanuts we use to pack with, you know, they're green, recyclable, et cetera. The jars that we use, you know, same thing. So we have to look at it from all aspects of our manufacturing, as well as those relationships that we have with customers. You have no idea how many customers will call us to find out whether our packaging is recyclable or not. So I think there's a greater awareness of that. And people are also now starting to make buying decisions, um, you know, based on whether they think a brand is eco-friendly, sustainable, um, you know, what we do with our waste, how much waste do we have? You know, I think we had a call a couple of weeks ago where somebody had read on our label that we use lemon juice and they wanted to know what we did with the skin of the lemon, you know, um, things like that. So, yeah, I think people are more conscious. I think people, uh, especially today's generation, they're so focused on um, where their food is sourced from. Are we staying sustainable? Are we protecting the earth? Are we you know, trying to make this world a better place. And I think that's really, really key to how we produce and develop foods. I love that you guys do that. Uh, we have another question on here. It's uh, from a while back. It said from the Baramjis, which was what one Parsi dish has the most sustainability in being able to be transformed into a different dish? Do you guys have any ideas on that? I think Dansa, you can throw anything in it. It's, it's like how they say the kitchen sink is what I think I call Tansak. And <laughs> it's pretty much uh, you push in any products in it, any types of vegetables. And the best way to make uh, a generation who doesn't eat vegetables too much, eat vegetables in a more sustainable way, get your protein in there through the lentil. I think I would, uh, I would say that, but uh, I think Nilofa might be able to answer that question better because she has got a plethora of uh, history on this. Uh... No, I would agree. Even if it's not Dansak, it's definitely Dal. Like, Dal is so versatile and you can just put anything and everything and it tastes good. And I also, while I'm teaching, always tell people that less is more. Uh, don't think that you need to uh, use every uh, spice in your jar box, you know. And I had, talking of that, I had a friend who last week told me that all her life she thought Indian food, she doesn't know about Parsi food, she's Polish. And if you have that round little box with all the different spices, she said, I always thought that Indian food is one teaspoon of each everything. And I was laughing and I said, are you joking? <laughs> And she said, no, no, I really thought everybody has this little box and they put one, one teaspoon and that's what Indian food is. And that's why everything tastes the same. And that is exactly what I try to tell people that it's not supposed to taste the same. It's supposed to look different, taste different. And that's why you have a variety. So less is more. You don't have to put everything into everything. Allow that vegetable or that particular, whatever you're cooking, to be the star of the show. Don't overpower it with all the thousands of things that you have lying around. And also remember, Parsi food was never meant to be spicy. It's always mm -hmm. be well balanced between the thikku, khattu, and mittu. Never spicy. Spicy is overtaking whatever you're cooking. If you can only taste the chili, it's not on. It's a good tip. Yeah. Thank I you. I agree. Um, but here's another question we have. Thank you, Nilfar. That was awesome. And thank you, um, Jangir, as well. Good point. 
are you guys concerned about cultural misappropriation? For example, you know, Starbucks using the name Chai. Um, how do you guys feel about that? I want to sue them. I don't want to sue them for using the word chai, but I hate when they say something like chai tea. Tea latte. Please, for God's sakes, open the dictionary. That really annoys me. Why are they even allowed to say it? Well, it's all about branding and it's about how you um, market a product, right? Um, people don't know in other cultures that chai means tea. Um, it, does it annoy me sometimes? Absolutely. But coming from the you world, I, teach them. Them. Right. This is the, I come from a world of branding and it's been like the biggest boom and the, big, the greatest way to get people to even try and understand what chai is. And coming from a someone like Oprah, who is such a mogul in branding, um, for her to introduce it was even a bigger deal. So yes, it does annoy me, but I think it's... Um, but it is what it is and it's it's taken over the market and people love it and now they're trying to find the original roots of it which is interesting too i think it goes with all food products and food i think nowadays uh, a lot of us have used different terminologies like i mean like if you think about milfate i mean those uh, uh, or tartar and things like that you didn't keep those uh, you only kept that for a certain dish. You can't, you never thought of a beet tartar. Now calling a, right. asking for a beet tartar is so normal, you know, or a, uh, or a vegetable. Those philosophies were not used or those terminologies were not used. You didn't call it uh, just because you use uh, puff pastry and a little bit of meat and, and you built it up just like a milfei. You would never have called it 50 years ago uh, meat milfe, but now we do because I think these philosophies and these terminologies have translated so beautifully. In some ways, I see it as a beauty that if that is the way to get someone to try something different, is just through the aspect of looks to to taste or to uh, or introduction. I see their point as a company. Does it sometimes some terminologies bother? Yes, they will bother each of us in a different format, which means very much something very close to our heart. It, it will uh, irk us in some ways, I think. But I, I, at this point, I mean, very honestly, I made, uh, uh, instead of patrani machi, I used to put tofu and make it for the vegetarians and, and, and do it in that sense. Now, have I bastardized that recipe to some people? Yes, maybe. And, uh, and to some people, it was, uh, to a vegetarian, it was a great introduction to a dish which they could not have. So I think sometimes mm -hmm. it's a yes and sometimes it's a no. But uh, what I just feel is, uh, as Dalai Lama would say, don't let the behavior of others destroy your inner peace. Just go with it. Have let uh, the, just see the good aspect that at least some people got introduced to a product like chai which they were not even introduced to and and leave it and let go yeah especially Vera, if i can just jump in on two Please things that. one is um the language i think is really important so for example in our case we had the veng nanu achar okay by calling it an achar, I would limit my audience immediately. And what I found is that with so many different cultures, they have similar things that they might be eating and using in a different way. In the case of the Vengnanu achar, I found that it was very similar to a caponata. So a caponata traditionally would have pine nuts and uh, raisins and um, olives often in it. You know, ours did not have that and we specifically removed the raisins from Atlanta jar because we have it in so many of our other, we have various different raisins in our other products. But by calling it a caponata, all of a sudden, those people who are familiar with caponata, um, many of Italian origin or Spanish origin, were able to say, ah, Caponata, and we would say, yeah, this is a sort of a South Asian inspired or South Asian riff on a caponata. 
So when you are doing demos and they actually try the product and they'll say, oh, wow, that's really interesting. And they're able to make those comparisons and contrasts. If I say a chart, immediately, you know, there would be an opposition to it because it would be somewhat unfamiliar. They wouldn't understand the language and so on. Coming to another point that John Gray made, which I think is so critical, which is, you know, the part of the issue with language is it catapults us into innovation. There are times that I, I use a spice blend, which is what could be viewed as a chai blend. Um, and actually the, the, the gentleman who grinds it for us, we've actually called it a chai blend as a, just a short form so that he knows, you know, how and where to kind of categorize it. Um, but it also helps us to innovate. So for example, if you're stuck with only calling a beef tartar a tartar, you can never transpose that feeling, that effect, that innovation into other things. And if you're not going to innovate with tofu, for instance, instead of the fish, your cuisine and the culinary history is going to stop there. It's going to be limited. Innovation keeps it going. So in fact, um, so I, I mean, I think that's key. And I think it's key that people like John Deere, Nilufar, from different aspects are continuing to innovate and bring different things into the fore. Otherwise, the cuisine would just simply die. Yeah, that's a great Absolutely. Question. Naomi, you're correct. The only reason that I objected to the chai tea is because you're using the same word in two languages. Mm -hmm. okay? So that's the only objection. It just sounds wrong or incorrect. It's not about innovation. Or no, no, I was just using that yeah. as a example. No, I'm just saying that there are things like uh, turmeric ginger shots at pret a in London. Five pounds this much. And they're selling it at Heathrow before you sit on the plane because it says it prevents you from getting a cough and a cold among the 300 that you sit with. And everybody's having one. So you just have to be so clever to be able to go forward with these things and nothing wrong in it, nothing wrong in it. And I just laughed because the guy told me once that daddy dood or haldi pilate the abhi paach paun ka mujhe mil raha hai. You know, he just, <laughs> like, it was so funny. I think it's really enterprising. Yeah, because people are queued up to have this. So whoever thought of it, <laughs> For five pounds, yeah. was like literally five ml, fantastic. So I, I give them full well, credit for it, but you know, whatever it is, it is. It's all about marketing. Exactly. Yeah. At the right time. I personally, I don't believe in cultural appropriation and all that. I think it's misused a lot of times. I feel like food is the one thing that brings people of the together. world yeah. together. And how do you learn about their cultures? How do you learn about their traditions if not through food? Food is one of the main aspects of everybody's life. And how, then if you don't have that, how do you learn tolerance for any other people, any other Absolutely. culture, any yeah. other tradition? Absolutely. Well I said. just think it's so overused in everything. I mean, at that rate, we would only be eating dhansak and curry chawal. We would not be able to eat Chinese food or Italian food or sushi or anything as Parsis, you know, we would be limited to Patrani Machi, this, 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 and that's it. Tell us. That's not how you live. Yeah. So, how boring. Awesome. Well, let's move on to the next question. We have quite a few to get through. So um, the next question is from Debbie Alia. Uh, where is the boundary between cosmetically challenged and rotten? So that is the nominal original reason people want beautiful produce. The link between, what is the link between beauty and health? I think you guys covered it a little bit, but if you want to talk about it a little bit more, we have time for it. Sure. So I think uh, as, uh, as any profession, 
you do know when you are crossing, if you are going to use something bad to get someone sick, I think that is definitely wrong. Uh, no doubt about it. But if you do know that, for instance, uh, I mean, if a product is even on the borderline of trying to starting to ferment, but you were going to make a pickle out of it, or you were going to cook it to a that in a different in a vat in a very very uh, precise way, there is going to be no issues to it. Uh, on the other hand, you know, so it all depends on what you're cooking, and in the end, is that product finally bad for you to eat? As personally. Are you going to make someone sick? And, and that goes with also with the aspect of, uh, of donations. It has been, uh, the law is basically if you donate and if knowingly you knew that food was bad and you have donated it, yes, there is mm -hmm. someone who could sue you. But if you have donated with the goodwill of your heart, not knowing it, it no one, there is a law that no one can sue you. I mean, yes, it is, a very, it is that fine line, which I think as a human and as a race, we need to make as, I'm sorry to bring it back again to Dalai Lama, who I really, really admire as a human. And what he has said is, we're the only species with, who have destroyed and have the power to destroy the earth. And we are also the only species who have the capacity to protect it. So I think Amen. it is very important for us to know how as a human we act and, and what is the in right conscience, what we are doing as a person, and then there will not be that issue. So it is, you can do business as a crook and you can do business as a good person. Both might make money, some might, the crook might even make more money, but is it with the right conscience? So I think that is where I would leave it at that. Awesome. Thank you, Jangir. Uh, Naomi, we have a question for you. Um, how difficult, this is from Vizana, by the way. Uh, the question is, how difficult was it to get people to latch onto a new and strange cuisine? And do you have a lot of explaining to do? Or did you just let people sample and then they like it? I know you touched on it a little bit in the question before, but if you'd like to expand on it. Naomi, are we Mute. I think I mute her. Sorry. There you go. Um, customer education has been one of our biggest challenges, but it's also been one of the most exciting areas for us, especially when I was, uh, when we were much smaller and I was doing it myself everywhere. Um, and I still do try to do it myself wherever I can because um, it is extremely insightful to get that direct feedback from customers and to also understand where some of the gaps and challenges might be from a palette perspective and from a familiarity perspective. So um, one of the things that we did when I first started the company was to think about the branding and why we went with a French name, Le Bon Mago, and what that means and you know, how that translates into the market. So it was very important to me that the name and the packaging was not tied into any kind of particular ethnic group. We didn't want it, or you know, or national group. We wanted to sidestep away from traditional images of food or spices or geographies that would, um, you know, that would kind of bias people into either purchasing or not purchasing the products. We wanted them to stand up for themselves, and the use of French was purely as a common denominator, French being the language of classical cuisine, we wanted people to understand that what they were purchasing had process, history, um, and technique behind it. So it was kind of a subliminal push there. With some of the ingredients, what we did was 
you know, originally we were quite detailed in how we explained the name. So we had a, a primary line for what it was. So we would say tomato and white sultana chutney. And then we would have a descriptor line with fresh ginger and garam masala. So we set that up from the beginning and we will continue to do that with our products. But one of the things that it taught me very quickly was because we're selling in the North American market predominantly, um, we have to use language and vernacular that is common in the US for the particular ingredients. So even where there may be a slight variation, for example, sultana versus a raisin, it's still better to use green raisin rather than sultana just to help people unravel it. Because, you know, for most people, while they may be familiar with cumin due to Mexican food over here, um, you know, all of a sudden when they're faced with too many ingredients that may not be familiar, they start getting intimidated and they put it back on the shelf. And, you know, as a small company being five years old, we do not have the kind of a brand recognition that a Heinz would have, let's say. So if Heinz introduces a new product, you would go to the grocery store shelf and say, I love their ketchup. Therefore, it's very likely I will like, like their mustard and I'm going to, you know, purchase that product. Plus, Heinz is not an investment. It's a $2, $3 jar. You put it into the grocery cart. And if you like it, great. If not, it gets tossed or it sits in the back of the fridge. With our products, people see them as investments because, you know, they're $10 and above. And, um, you know, even though we recommend an SRP, a retail price of $10, oftentimes grocery stores will just price however they want to. And ridiculous as it is, there's a store in New York carrying them for $18 a jar. So, you know, people view it as an investment and they want to make sure that they use every aspect, you know, of it. So they want to be familiar and comfortable. But yeah, customer education has been a big much bigger investment than I actually ever thought that it would be. Yeah. Thank you, Naomi. That's a great response. I'm sure it's been challenging, especially during these times, but hopefully um, you're able to get on your feet and keep things moving, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So great. So we have, um, you know, this has been a great conversation. We have time for one last question. Um, and it's from uh, Roshan. She says about health benefits, does fresh ginger, fresh turmeric root uh, have more health benefits than powdered turmeric and ginger? Is there anyone who would like to answer that? Ginger, definitely fresh, but turmeric, if it's not adulterated, it doesn't matter. You have to make sure that it's just pure turmeric. And nowadays in uh, grocery stores, you get organic, small turmeric, mm -hmm. but that's pretty pungent. But ginger, I have to say, fresh is best. You have to agree to that because the dry thing, first of all, could be five years old. You wouldn't know. And we do use it in our sua park and stuff like that. But when you rip open the uh, packaging, you can actually smell, if it's fresh, it will be really pungent and otherwise it will be very dull. So you don't really know how long it's been sitting there. Uh, but turmeric has a very long shelf life. Again, uh, it can be from the ordinary Indian store, nothing good or bad, but as long as it's not mixed with something. Okay. Hmm. Anybody else or? Nilufa, do you think some of these spices are better off refrigerated or just kept in the pantry? So I've always ground my own spices because of this, mm -hmm. because you don't know what's in it. So if you have a, if you invest in a coffee grinder, you can do your own 
coriander seeds, cumin seeds, what you use. Yeah, I do all that. Yeah, Yeah, and it's brilliant because you can actually smell the difference. But then, Mm -hmm. of course, there's things like tansak masala that I get from Karachi, which is in the fridge a very long time. Okay. It would not stay outside. Yeah, it would not stay outside for that long. So that is important. And also, if you toast it, if you have something that you think has been very old, if you toast it, it kind of brings the oils back onto the, the flavors back. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, my my um, I'm from that generation where everything was cooked for me, and I had no idea that spices could be ground and done whatever with. Um, and my aunt actually, when I moved to America, introduced me to how to grind spices and make your own spices and you don't just have to buy them from the store and that you roast them. And, and she taught me how to make um, this amazing kamla's curry as we used to call it. And uh, it was such a game changer to use fresh spices and fresh um, ground, you know, just grind them by yourself and figure it out and roast them. Such a game changer. It's, um, and it adds to, the, I think, the sustainability conversation that, you know, you're using, you know, you're using spices to the best of their abilities and not just tossing them when you think they're old and, you know, you just keep them going and keep them fresh. So, uh, Roshan, thank you for that question. Great question. Um, well, I think that was a, that was a really important and great conversation, especially given the times we're in. Um, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you to the entire audience we've had as well. Um, do you guys have anything you'd like to add before we end? Yeah, so uh, you know, while we were on this talk, I, I and, and you know, talk about food and cultural appropriation and also, uh, you know, what Arbe said about how food can become something that, that informs other people about other cultures brings me back to uh, an exercise that you yourself were involved with, along with Nilufar and Roshan Auntie, Roshan Nivetna, who's here, where I think a couple of Navroses, uh, Jamshiri Navroses, I think in 2017, uh, along, you know, Fizana had kind of tried to put out an initiative with Beram Pastakia heading it, where we had asked, uh, you know, we had suggested that people can make, uh, you know, one, one uh, dish that is typical to us. So I think all of you all had made uh, Ravo, and then share that with your neighbors on your block, on your street, uh, with Here a small group saying what it was. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think that was, you know, as, as a small experiment that was really successful at that time. And, uh, you know, we want to recreate that uh, in 2021. And so we'll, we'll lean on you guys again. And, you know, through the power of PER kind of help spread this word and, and you know, just inform more people on your block and, and around your local communities about what Jamshadi Navroz and therefore what Zoroastrians are. So uh, I, I, I just thought I should share that out. And so in, in you know, closer to Navroz, we will we'll put out some guidelines for people to kind of, you know, do this again. Thank you, Arzan. Yeah, I, that was a really great initiative. And I've, I've actually done it every year. I didn't do it this year because of COVID. I didn't know how people would feel about me delivering um, something that's been cooked in my home. But um, I did do it later on in the summer where I, you know, made, I discovered how you can make save in the instant pot. And it was such a game changer for me because I've never made save so quickly and perfectly in my life than I have instant pot. Um, So what I did was I took that same concept of putting it in jars and, and I distributed it to my neighbors and they were suddenly introduced to this whole new world of a sweet vermicelli for them, right? And how you can take, uh, and they, some of them had never even eaten golden raisins. They'd only eaten, you know, the black raisins that you get. Um, so for them, it was such a different experience. And the other day I made um, biryani. I'm trying to clean out my pantry, obviously. So I, uh, I made this huge amount of biryani and I gave a big pot of it to my neighbors next door who, have, you know, their husband is suffering from cancer, their kid is like going through this other situation and and they had never had biryani. And for them, it was like, holy crap, what is this? This is amazing. They've never had something like that so flavorful. And and it just, it just opens up, it's opened up my neighbor's world to this, this whole new place of, wow, you know, cuisines from other cultures are not this, 
you know, spice driven forbidden fruit that you shouldn't try, but it's so, um, it's so exciting for them now. And they all, they kind of email me or text me and they're like, so what are you making now? I smell something from your window, you know? <laughs> so I'm, I almost feel obligated to go give little pots of food now to the neighbors. Cause I'm like, oh man, all right, I better make more. <laughs> Even I've continued except for this year. I've also done yeah. that. Yeah. And it's, it's really nice. Uh, and the good, the second year, I don't know, Vera, you remember somebody had actually written a little note and we had to print it and put it yes. in so that they knew what we were doing. Yes. And I think that was very important, Arzan, and that part of it uh, should be definitely uh, what we should be yes. sharing with PR yes. or whatever, uh, so that people realize, because just giving a jar is okay, but this sort of makes them think, Google, learn, ask, you know? Right, right. That's and, what the yeah. base. Mm -hmm. We had Roshan. Right. We, we put together like an easy to kind of print. Uh, you yeah, know, a small print thing. It was a small. On, on yeah. our printers, cut it up, uh, yeah. and kind of, you know, have a uniform message. And then, you know, as you said, rightly put links, simple links that people can go to and just learn about a new festival, a new culture. Right. Yeah. Okay. We had Roshan Nirvetna and Baram Pastakya put that thing together for us. And then, you know, we were at, uh, we could just print it however we wanted to. So we did that. And then, you know, we put instructions for how you heat it. And yeah. it was really <laughs> interesting for people to understand the history, the culture, and where this came from. And I think that's what really stuck with my neighbors is, oh, that's interesting. And we actually yeah. have both of them on the call. Roshan Aunty is there too. And so oh, okay. Thank you, Roshan and Anvira. Thank you. That was that was really great. But if you all don't want to go through the trouble of making stuff, there are jars which are very, very readily available at Le Bon Manco. That's so true. just yes. do that. It will awesome. save you and you would look like a winner. Believe you me. That's so, true. Thank and, you. And, and, <laughs> yeah. I've done that too. <laughs> and, and as Abraham can say... Great like, segue. Yeah, I don't... like. Uh, I don't like that man. I must get to know him better. That would be a good thing to do to know your neighbors better. But I'm not talking about Trump, but we're talking about everyone else, Biden. But other than that, okay, so. I see Roshan Auntie. Hi, Roshan Auntie. Yeah, yes, I have a nice little flyer, a little postcard that we can put with your little um, mitai or whatever you give to your neighbors. It gives a little bit of history of Persian of food and Zoroastrianism and, and uh, I'll be happy to share it with anybody. Thank you. Sounds great. Thank you. I still use the write-up that you gave us for Shanti, so I just make that into a card and I, I distribute that. So hopefully we can do it again next year when people feel a little more comfortable accepting food from their neighbors during COVID. I think this is one of Behram Pastakya's uh, little brainchild, and we want to thank him for encouraging this. It is. It is. He's been very, um, he's been a great proponent of it, and um, we, we really look forward to continuing to share this tradition on uh, PER. So we'll, we'll start marketing it hopefully sometime in January again to get people ready for March No Rose. Um, before that, this, this is actually a great segue, um, Changir. Uh, Azermin Jamasji from Delis Glace came up with a super idea of uh, putting together a gift guide for the holiday season and inviting people, whoever is interested in being a part of this, that we can post on Pur and possibly even on Fezana's magazine. And so we'll be putting this out on per sometime in the coming week and inviting people to join in on this gift giving guide that they can use to then send gifts to people. Great. Sounds good. Great idea. We'll, we'll I definitely think I've lost my audio here. We'll, we'll post more about it on um, PER, but Jangir, I hope you're a part yes. of PER and um, I hope you all uh, choose to join BER and, and, um, and it's on, you know, you have the links there. Feel free to join. Please check out Nilofer's Kitchen and um, also Naomi and 
Jung Gear's um, ventures. I think you would really enjoy them. Thank you for this great, great conversation today. Arbiz and I really appreciate you guys taking the time to do this and to all our participants for joining us. I think we had a really, really good turnout. Thank you so much. Um, hopefully we'll do this again in another couple of months and we'll try to keep it going and bring up fresh new ideas and, and um, hopefully you can all be a part of it. So thank you. I hope you guys have a great weekend. New participants on the panel as well. We hope to get more people to join the panel as well. Yeah, and we've got like- That would be almost, awesome. Yeah, we've got almost like 14,000 people on PR. So let's keep it going. Yep. Awesome. Yeah. Great. Thank you, thank you guys. Thank, thank you, Susanna. Thank you all very much. Bye. Thank you. Naomi, Nola, friend John Gear. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you for having us. Put all the links in our chat, so do follow. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Great. Thank Bye. you, guys. Bye. Bye.